welcome back to my homestead. Today I am standing in one of my flower gardens and I wanted to introduce you to a very beautiful flower. It's so beautiful that it stands out among all the other flowers. You will see it from the distance. Why? Because it's such a bright and prominent color. What I'm talking about is bee balm. Well, that's one of the names, bee balm. But the other name that is often being called is monarda. Some people call it scarlet bee balm, uh, mountain mint, and it is from a mint family. Because if you chew on the petals of the flower, it will have slightly minty, bitter, uh, spicy taste. So this flower adorns and makes any flower bed even more attractive. But it's also edible and it's also medicinal. So medicinally, let me just give you a quick little disclaimer. I don't advise or recommend any herbs on my channel. So because I'm not a doctor, I don't diagnose, I don't treat and or advise any herbs. Always do your own research to know what is safe, what is effective and what is good for you. Talk to your physicians. I just like to share things that I know, things that I have in my own arsenal as far as the herbal treatments for myself and for my family. So let's talk about bee balm. The thunderstorms are rolling in pretty soon so I need to harvest them because they are coming to the end of their blooming season and I need to hurry up. So here is a, a almost maroonish color flowers. Let me see where if I can get them on the camera. There it is. And it's very, very fluffy petals, very fluffy petals, very bright color. It has a square. If you look, it has the stem has four sides to them. Literally, if you rub against the stem, it has four sides to it. And the leaves, just like on Noah's Ark, two by two, the, the leaves will come two leaves on each side, parallel to each other. See, one, two, then across one, two. And they um, will resemble of a round shape with a pointy side. And the sides, the edges are a little bit slightly jagged. You will see that it has um, maroonish tint when it gets closer to the, um, to the stem. And they literally stand out among all the other flowers. So they come in different colors. Some of them are more purple, some of them uh, lilac color, and I have two types. I have this more uh, maroon color and I have one scarlet red on the other side of my garden. These are perennial flowers that will come up every year. I hopefully guys you can hear me because the wind is picking up because we're expecting storms to come in through. Every day we've been having storms and uh, rain that sort of thing and I've been waiting for a dry day to collect my herbs because yes they need to be collected on a dry day so this plant is very tall it's probably about uh, three feet tall maybe even taller three and a half feet tall um, and it's best to harvest these flowers when they're in a full bloom and some of the leaves I will be um, harvesting as well so they are can be used in um, in cooking the petals can be put in fl fruit salads, into garden salads. They can be added to muffins and breads. Um, but the leaves can also um, be used in tea. As a matter of fact, after the Boston Tea Party, when their settlers no longer had any tea coming in, they've learned from the Native Americans that you can use these uh, flowers to make tea, and it's called Oswego tea. So it's uh, and it makes it makes a delicious tea, but yes, it can be used medicinally as well in many different forms. So let me harvest a few because I'm gonna hurry before the rain comes in, and then I'll show you what we can do with them and what they're good for. All right. Okay, friends. So earlier today, I harvested a bunch of these beautiful flowers, right? The bee balm and a huge thunderstorm rolled in and was like having a field day uh, drowning everything around for several hours and it got dark. So it got dark, but I need to process these beautiful uh, herbs anyway. So I moved in into this new little space I have, what's formerly known as the kids treehouse. Well, what to do with the treehouse when the kids have grown and no longer interested in using it. 
So I have converted it into like a little space where I can study, read, and just sort of get away from all the noise and commotion. So welcome to my new space. I love it here. And so I need to process them, but I wanted to talk to you about what you can use these uh, flowers, these petals, because they are so, so fragrant. Oh my word, guys, I hope you can like find them and like really admire them because they're amazing. Um, like I've said, they have a little bit of spicy kind of lemony minty taste. The petals can be dried for tea. And they're going to be beautiful in a tea just like that. And they're going to dry very, very quickly because they're so, so delicate. Um, but the leaves and the stems can be used um, for in a tincture. And I'm going to be making fermented herbal tea. Uh, or excuse me, I'm going to ferment them to be used in a tea. So um, I want to talk to you quickly about... Um, this flower. So first of all, this one is domesticated, right? It's domesticated, but there's also a wild version and a wild version is gold bargamot and it looks very, very different. The flowers are um, more of like lilac, a pale color. The stems look a little bit different. So I'm going to throw in a picture for you guys just to look at it because it's definitely different than what I have, but the properties are very, very similar. So what is this bee balm monarda is used for? Well, they use for many different things. First of all, uh, it is an antimicrobial, antibacterial uh, herb. So it's used for cold, flu, uh, UTI, bladder infection, respiratory infection, uh, and uh, it's used uh, for GI infections. So when there's nausea, upset belly, bloating, that's when it's also used. But it also has um, antispasmatic properties. So uh, when there is a um, menstrual cramps or sore muscles after working all day, you can use that as well. Uh, even like throw it, it, it like dry herb in a bath and take a bath with that will help to relax. It has a mild nervine property, so mild anxiety or um, stress, difficulty sleeping will help to relax and calm everything down. It can be used externally, so for scrapes, for cuts, it's antiseptic, so it can help with that, or uh, bug bites, it will help with that as well. Um, so there are many ways this plant can be used. It can be used uh, as a tea. It can be used as a tincture. It can be infused in raw honey and used for um, like sore throats, that sort of thing. It can be used as inhalation. So dried herb is uh, put it in a boiling water and then breathing over steam will help with that spasmodic cough with sore throat. Okay. So these flowers have this component that's called thymol. Thymol is the disinfectant uh, component that's often found in mouthwash to fight any kind of like infection, fungus in the mouth or something like that. So this uh, plant also contains that property. Um, so it can be used as, um, like I said, like a tincture, a honey syrup, mouthwash, it can be used in cooking, and I think I've mentioned that already. So I'm going to be making two things today. One, I'm going to be making my very basic tincture, and you already know how I make my tinctures, but I will show it to you again today. And the second thing is that besides taking these beautiful petals off and drying them, I'm going to be taking all of these leaves and stems, okay? I'm going to put them in a uh, freezer bag, and I'm gonna put them in a freezer overnight, just for several hours, you know, six, eight uh, hours overnight. And then tomorrow morning, when they're nice and frozen, I'm gonna take them out and quickly thaw them out. And as they're thawing out, I'm gonna break them up because that's gonna be my first step in fermenting my, um, my plant material. If you have followed me for a while now, guys, I know that um, I'm a huge, uh, proponent of having, rather than having a basic dried herb to ferment it because fermentation helps to extract more of those benefits 
from those leaves, from those cells by breaking them and releasing them. And the tea will be made with a fermented herb, will be dark, rich, and fragrant. Very different than if you just cut them up and dry them, okay? Which is not a bad idea, but it's totally different. So I strongly recommend, guys, to try this fermentation process. So, but tonight, all I'm going to do is I'm going to throw them in the freezer. And then tomorrow morning, I'll show you what I'm going to do. Uh, also today, I'm going to be making my very basic tincture because tincture is very easy to make. Tincture can be stored for a long, long time. Tinctures can be stored for like 10, 15 years, whereas dried herbs, a year, a two, maybe, and that's it. So tinctures have a longevity, so and it can also be sitting on your shelf somewhere. So I'm going to make a small tincture today, but also I'm going to be making fermented tea. So I have a very small uh, jar here and I'm going to be filling this up with my herb. I do not wash my herbs. I never wash my herbs when I use them. However, um, I don't know if you can see it. I'm going to show you these leaves. These leaves are nice and clean. There is no pottery mildew. So something about this bee balm that you need to know. If you see that white film kind of like spotty uh, discoloration on the leaves, it's called pottery mildew and that plant cannot be used for herbs. Okay, that's it. You have to let it go. And unfortunately, right now it's a rainy season in New England. We're getting a lot of rain. Okay, what I'm doing, I'm just cut, cutting everything up into smaller sections. Um, so uh, more... Uh, more um, surface area is exposed to uh, to break down in the, I'm just going to break this off, um, and be covered with my alcohol. Alcohol, I use vodka and either 80% uh, proof or 100% proof vodka. That's what I use, okay? And I try to use a fresh um, plant material. I find it to be the best when I use it. All right, so I'm just cutting. Let me move my camera see. All right, can you guys see this better now? So all I'm doing is I'm just cutting things up into my small jar. I don't make uh, a very big portions of uh, tinctures because a little goes a long way and you're literally using just dropfuls when, um, when you need to use a tincture, okay? You don't need to use a lot, okay? So um, I try not to discuss the dosages because I am not a prescriber and I don't prescribe how much to take. So whenever you guys um, take an herb, always do your own research to know how much you should be taking, okay? I know it for my family, but I'm not an herbalist and I'm not a doctor and I will not uh, tell you how much to take, all right? All right, so here's the thing. Um, see how I'm just cutting them in smaller sections so more uh, surface area is exposed to release more uh, medicinal properties into the vodka. How much herb to use and how much vodka? Well, the best um, formula when it's a used fre fresh plant material is to use two to one, meaning two parts, um, two parts of plant material, one part of vodka. So you can either do it by weight or I just eyeball it and I just cut everything up like this and I push into a jar as much as I can and then I fill it up with vodka. And then it's gonna sit in a dark place, okay, in a dark place for about six to eight weeks. And first week I cut them up, uh, excuse me, in the first week I shake the jar once a day once a day, twice a day, if I remember. But after that, maybe a couple of times a week. That's all. And then eight, uh, six to eight weeks later, okay, I will strain it. And I use cheesecloth to strain everything and I squeeze as much of the juice out of it as possible. And then I put it in a dark, small bottle just like this. And I always label it and I always put a date and I always uh, say what has been mixed in so I will know what it is because after you know after it's been strained or whatever you can't tell what it is so always always label everything so now I'm just going to cover everything with vodka and either 80 or 100 percent proof vodka although the stems got stuck to my arm here 
I'm not going to show you which one I'm using because I'm not promoting promoting one or the other. So, um, but I'm just going to fill up everything to the top, okay? And make sure that um, all the plant material is covered with um, with with the with vodka, so there's no oxidation going on. I'm going to put a cover on, and I'm always recycling these tiny little jars from peanut butter, from sunflower butter, you name it, baby food, whatever you want it to be, and always put a label. So I said bee balm in vodka made in July 2021, and eight, six to eight weeks from now, it will be ready for straining. Okay, so after spending one night in the freezer, this is what they look like. They're nice and cold and frozen, okay? So let me just take it out and show you. And basically, they're still nice and deep uh, green color, but they are super, super soft, super soft. And right now, what I need to do is I need to take these leaves and roll them in my hands like this because that will break up the uh, cellular structure of all of these leaves. And I'm basically just rolling them in my hands like this, okay? And it's going to allow all of those nutrients to be released from these from these leaves okay from this just like this all right this is the step where you need to have clean hands and you're just kind of rolling them and it has an amazing aroma filling up my kitchen right now because it has that nice peppery kind of smell a little bit of minty smell but it's not the big mint like mint mint but it definitely has a little bit of a minty smell to it I wish I had more of this plant but I don't, and I have not been fortunate enough to find it um, in the wild, like a wild uh, growing somewhere in the fields. But if I do, I will definitely try to, um, I will try to have some harvesting, harvest, harvest it for my, for my herbal collection, because I do use this plant a lot. And of course, you can always order online, and there are reputable uh, places that you can do so, okay? But, um, but it's nothing like homegrown because what, whatever you order online, you don't know how it was raised, how it was harvested, you know, and I can tell you for sure, it's not going to be fermented. Fermenting herbs is very popular in Russian culture, in Russian herbal culture. So, um, when I speak to a lot of my Russian and Ukrainian herbalists, they all know what this means to ferment herbs for tea, because it's going to give you that rich, rich fragrant dark tea very different if you just if you just dried it you know what i mean that's it okay so that's pretty much it i don't have any more so now that they've been rolled and kind of broken up like this okay i am going to now leave it in let me put this all in here i'm going to leave it here in the in the bowl just like this okay i'm going to put it back in the bag just to protect it from any kind of contamination because I don't want any bugs to get in or anything like that. I'm going to close it and I'm going to leave it in my kitchen counter to ferment for the next four, five, six hours. If um, I'm, I'm hoping to have it done by tonight, but it's kind of getting late. So I'm going to try to go as much as six hours for fermenting. I'm going to take a little towel I will cover that to keep it nice and warm on my counter. It's already warm because it's hot summer. But I'm going to leave it in my kitchen counter to ferment just like this for the next six hours before I actually put it in a dehydrator. All right, they've been in the dehydrator for about six and a half hours. And my herbs are super dry. And that's how you want them to be. Very, very crunchy. Okay? You don't want to store them if they're still soft and pliable. They will go moldy so now everything is nice and dry and I'm gonna store everything in a glass jar and that's and I'm gonna label it and I'm gonna store in my medicine cabinet yes my herbal medicine cabinet um, but I also think it's a great time to make a cup of tea